I was so prepared for that. Hi you guys, so uh, today I'm going to be going over the rest of the Iron Yard. I was going to try and finish it yesterday, as those of you who have seen yesterday's stream will know, that didn't happen. I went into a bit too much detail I think, but that didn't happen. So today I'm going to be finishing off where I got to on book 11, and finishing off book 12, and possibly starting some seams. I don't think it will take that long, but you know, book 12 is a chunky one, so... Who knows? Um, I was considering restarting book 11, which I think is something that I might do uh, just to make it easier for both me and you. So yes, that's going to be done. Okay, so I'll start my timer. Um, it's going to be max an hour. So uh, yeah, let's get going. Also, I have a migraine coming on, so if I speak or sound excited or sound engaged that's for that reason sorry in advance right plant check okay let's go so book 11 after the death of the mesentius we're told that anxious and eager as aeneas was to give time to burying his comrades distraught as he was in mind at their deaths he still wants to pay his vows to the gods he cuts off all the branches of an oak, dedicates them out as a trophy to the great god Mighty in War, and then clothes it in Mesentius' armour. This is what a hero was meant to do when they defeated their enemy and took their armour, so it shows that Aeneas is following the proper procedure. All of the Trojan leaders are pressing hard around him, so he speaks a few words to them. He tells them that the greatest part of their work is done, and tells them about the armour that he's stolen from Mesentius, saying how they are spoils he has taken from a proud king, the first fruits of war. He tells them to make themselves ready for war and fill their minds with hope so that they will not hesitate. When that time comes, there must be no fate-heartedness or sluggishness in our thoughts to slow us down. He tells them that they must now bury their dead before they go out to fight for that is the only honour a man has in the underworld. Aeneas decides that Pallas should be taken back to Evander City, and says that he was a warrior who did not fail in courage when his black day took him from us and drowned him in the bitterness of death. He is weeping, and he makes his way back to where Pallas's body is guarded by Acoetes, Evander's old armour-bearer. Around them are their attendants and all the Trojans and Trojan women with their hair unbound in mourning after the manner of their people. But when Aeneas enters, they beat their breasts and raise a lament. When Aeneas sees Pallas's head and his face and the open wound, he begins to weep and says that it is such a pity. Fortune came to me with smiles but took you from me while you were still a boy and would not let you live to see us in our kingdom or to ride back in triumph to your father's house. He says that this was not what he promised Evander, and that Evander will be making offerings, deluded by vain hopes, at that very moment. He asks how Evander will receive his dead son, and says that Italy has lost a great bulwark, and great too is your loss, Ulysses. This reveals that Aeneas almost seems to think of Pallas as like a son to him, because he treats him like Ulysses' brother, and he asks how An Evander will receive his dead son. Um... He also becomes a kind of father figure to Pallas, and he mourns him like a father would when he sees his body. After he'd finished weeping, he orders the men to take up the pitiable corpse and sends a thousand chosen men as escort to join their tears for the vander, a small comfort through a great sorrow. Other people weave a beer to make a raised couch, where they lay down Pallas, and he lies there like a flower cut by the thumbnail of a young girl, a soft violet or drooping lily, still with its sheen and its shape, though Mother Earth no longer feeds it and gives it strength. He brings out two robes woven with gold and purple, which Dido had made him, and places them on Pallas's body. He also orders spoils to be brought in the pyre too, adding the horses and weapons taken from the army and then the captives, whose hands he had bound behind their backs to send them as offerings to the shades of the dead and sprinkle the funeral pyre with the blood of their sacrifice. He commands the leaders of the army to carry tree trunks straight with the enemy's weapons and inscribed with their names. Acoetes is led along the procession, beating his breast with clenched fists and tearing his face with his nails, but he collapses. Pallas's warhorse Aethon follows behind, tears rolling down in great drops and soaking its face, while men carry his spear and helmet. The victorious Turnus had the rest. A large number of mourners followed, and after this procession marched clear of the camp, Aeneas halts and says, The same grim destiny of war calls us away from here to weep, weep other tears. Forever hail, great Pallas, and farewell forever. 
Then in silence, he marches back to the camp. Now, Virgil wishes to remind us of a certain ancient hero's death, and that would be Patroclus' death from the Iliad, which would highlight Virgil's own doctor, showing that he knows his Homeric links and that he is just as good as Homer with Epic. It also heightens the sympathy and shows Aeneas to be of the same vein as Achilles. He is just as good as him. Historically, it is also described very similarly to Marcellus's death procession, who had died around 20 BC and whose death had affected Augustus greatly because he was meant to be his heir and he was actually his nephew. Latin envoys are bearing olive branches wreathed in wool and they ask for a truce and they beg Aeneas to give back the bodies of their men that they strewn over the plain and to let them go to their grave in the earth, for he could have no quarrel with men who were defeated and had lost the light of life. Aeneas agrees to a truce and adds the words that fortune is cruel. You ask me for peace for the dead, whose destiny has been to die in battle. I, for my part, would have been willing to grant them peace when they were still alive. He says he does not wage war with the people, but that it is Latinus who abandoned their friendship and preferred to put his trust in Turnus's weapons. He says that Turnus should have faced him alone, and that only one of them would have lived if he had. God or our own right hands would have seen to that. Drances is described as an older man who had always hated the young warrior Turnus, and he's in this um, envoy, and he addresses Aeneas as O Trojan, great in fame, and greater still in arms. He asks what he should praise first, his justice or his labours in war, and then says he will gratefully carry his words back to Latinus. He will try to reconcile him with King Latinus, and Turnus can make his own treaties. We shall delight to raise the massive walls fate has decreed for you, and lift up the building stones of Troy on our shoulders. There is then a 12-day truce agreed upon, and the two sides, Trojans and Latins, are together in the hills and woods, and no man harmed each other. They split oaks and cedar with wedges to make funeral pyres and they do not fight. Rumour comes and warns Evander's house of anguish and the Arcadians rush to the gates, snatching up funeral torches. The road is lit up and the Trojans come forwards and when with the mothers of Palantium first see them entering, the stricken city was ablaze with their cries. We are told that no power on earth could restrain Evander and he threw himself onto Pallas' body and clung to it, weeping and moaning and saying that he has had a hard schooling in war. He says how none of the gods listened to his vows and prayers and invokes his wife, saying that she was fortunate in her death as she did not live to see this day. He says that he himself has outstayed his time, saying that a father should not survive his son and wishes that he had given up his own life rather than sent Pallas with Aeneas instead. He doesn't blame the Trojans, though, and says that the death of his son was a debt he was fated to pay in his old age. And this is important because this is Homer excusing Aeneas and the Trojans from all wrongdoing, which he seems to do quite a lot. He says that he will rejoice to think that Pallas killed the enemy before his death and says that he would not wish a better funeral than this upon his son. Then he addresses Turnus. And you too, Turnus, would now be standing in the fields, a huge headless trophy. Had Pallas been your equal in age, had the years given you both equal strength? He tells the Trojans to go back to Aeneas and continue fighting. When the dawn comes in a typical Homeric simile, we go back to the Trojan camp and Tarkin and Aeneas are building funeral pyres on the shore and carrying the bodies of their dead to them, each after the fashion of their fathers. They set fire to the pyres and the sky is plunged into darkness. Three times they ran around the blazing pyres in gleaming armour. Three times they rode in solemn procession around the fires of the dead with wails of lamentation and tears fell upon their armour and fell upon the earth beneath. Some throw into the flames spoils from the Latins, while others burn the possessions of their dead friends, and oxen are sacrificed to the god of death. They watch the bodies of their friends burn until night returns, and shows a sky studded with burning stars. The Latins build similar pyres quite a way away from the Trojans. They bury a few men in the earth, while others they carry back to their city or their countryside homes. The rest they burn and counted in an honoured a huge pile of jumbled corpses, and after the third day they level the ash in which the bones of the dead were mingled and weigh it down with earth. On that day, the noise of grief was at its loudest and their long mourning reached its height. We are given a list of how the mothers, wives, sisters and children cursed the war and Turnus' marriage. Drancy is bitter, swears that Turnus is the only man being asked to fight, but at the same time the Queen's name casts its protecting shadow and he is still in favour because of the memory of his great deeds. Now, it's quite interesting that they have different mourning rituals, and this would be to emphasise the difference of the Latins. The Latins are different to the Romans. They are other, if you do English literature, they're very, very um, different. They don't honour their dead in the same way. They just burn most of them and honour. They carry them back to their houses. They don't bury them. So 
it's all emphasizing that they're very not Roman. So then we go to a peace, um, peace sort of conference at Latinus's palace. A lot of people think that Turner should go out and fight the battle alone, Drancy's included, while others, including the Queen Amata, want to carry on with the war the way that it's going. Overall, though, they are all very much resentful of the war. The envoys arrive back with a gloomy answer, having achieved nothing for all their efforts. The Latins would have to look elsewhere for reinforcements or plead for peace with the Trojan king. Latinus is devastated and he thinks of how the gods in their anger are now telling him that fate indeed brought Aeneas here. He calls a council, commanding the leaders of the people to come, and they did, while greatest in age and first of those who carried the scepter, Latinus sat in the middle with sadness on his brow and demands to hear everything. Venulus tells him that they have seen the camp and gone to see Diomede, a hero from the Trojan War and the Greek site, who, if you've read the Iliad, you will remember. Um, after they were admitted, they told him their names and said who had made war among them, and Diomede replies that all of the people who attacked Troy are now scattered and have met awful fate. He mentions Menelaus and Agamemnon, particularly. He mentions how he bitterly regrets wounding Venus, because this that is what caused all of this, and says that he begs them not to urge him to take part in the battle. He would rather they give the gifts they brought him to Aeneas. Believe me, for I have known it, how huge he rises behind his shield, and with what a whir he spins his javelin. He says that if there were two Trojan heroes as great as Aeneas, it would be Greece that was in mourning, and that it was both Hector and Aeneas, both men noble in their courage, noble in their skill in arms, but Aeneas the greater in piety, that held back the Greek victory until the tenth year. Essentially, he tells them not to fight Aeneas and instead make a peace treaty with him because he's far too dangerous for them. And honestly, this is complete rubbish. If you read the Iliad, you will know that Aeneas was an awful warrior, saved by a mummy quite a lot of times, which certainly suggests that Virgil is manipulating what we know from epic history. He doesn't want people to think of Aeneas as he was in the Iliad. Rather, he's much like Hector and we can ignore everything that happened in the Iliad. Just take Virgil word for it. I don't like this, but to be honest, it's quite smart, so we've got to hand it to him. Um, the news is met with a confused roar, described as when rocks resist a river in spate and trapped waters eddy and growl while the banks on either side roar with the din of the waves. Then Latina says that they are fighting a misguided war against unconquerable heroes and the sons of gods, and that they have absolutely no chance of beating Aeneas and his men. He says that courage has done all that courage could do, but now he thinks that they should give an area of run to the Trojans as a token of their friendship. They should let them settle, and even if they want to leave, they should provide them with the materials to build the ships to do so. As well as this, he suggests that 100 envoys should be sent to make this treaty with Aeneas, holding out the branches of peace in their hands and bearing gifts. Chances rises, hostile, who has always looked askance at Turnus's great reputation and was goaded by bitter jealousy. We are told that his voice had some weight in councils and was always a force with discord. And then he speaks to Latinus, saying that everyone knows what their fortune is, but that everyone is too afraid to say it out loud. He says that it is because of Turnus's fatal recklessness that so many people have died and the whole of their city is now slumped in grief. He says that no one should be able to overrule Latinus's right to give Lavinia to whichever man he sees fit, and so Turnus has no right to try and keep her for himself. Then he rounds on Turnus. He asks why Turnus keeps dragging his fellow citizens into danger and calls him at the single source and cause of all these sufferings of Latium. He says that if he wants all he wants is peace, and that he begs him to pity his people and lay down his pride. He says that, however, if Turnus cannot give up his pride, he can keep going with his fighting, and that we, the rank and file, are to litter the fields, unburied and unwept, so that Turnus can keep his arrogance. We are told that Turnus blazed up into a violent rage at response to Drancy's, and spoke from the depths of his heart, saying that all Drancy's does is fill the Senate with talk while the walls are besieged by the enemy. He says that he can thunder out his eloquence in his usual style and accuse him of cowardice when they have killed the same amount of men, but says that now is the time to fight, and makes fun of him, calling him a coward. You scum of the earth, who can say I'm defeated when he sees the Thybris rising, swollen with Trojan blood, the house of Evander destroyed root and branch, and the Arcadians stripped of their arms? He goes on to say that he should go on insulting and stirring up panic, saying that fear is a pretense that adds sting to his charges against him. Finally, he says that Trancy has no reason to fear. He is not worthy enough to be killed by such a great man as himself. 
This certainly shows Turner as a Homeric hero as he obsessed with the idea of glory and takes Strancy's accusations as a personal attack. Furthermore, it shows that he's extremely prideful and rather full of himself, which would link back to arrogance, which would link back to Tarquinius Superbus, the last hated king of Rome. And also, you could link Trancy's to Cicero in the fact that he actually um, sits in the Senate complaining about people, but doesn't actually do anything himself. Um, so, Turnus calls King Latinus then father, sucking up to him basically and trying to retain his position as his son-in-law, and says that if he holds no hope in beating the Trojans, then they should stretch out the defenseless arms and sue for peace. However, if there were a spark of joy, um, if there were a spark of their courage left, they would be able to continue going and fighting. He mentions that surely the Trojans have had just as many funerals as them, and they have paid a heavy price in blood for the glory they have won. He asks why they fear when fortune comes and goes, and says that although Diomede will not help them, Mesopus will, and Ptolemyus, and all the leaders who have come to them, and Camilla. Finally, he says that if he really is the only one that the Trojans want to fight, he will go out alone and face Aeneas with his spirits high where he mightier than Achilles, and with armour that equally appears, made like his by the hands of Vulcan. This is highly ironic. Aeneas actually does have armour made by Vulcan and is technically better than Achilles, according to Virgil. So Turnus has just basically talked about how great Aeneas is in this really ironic, sarcastic way, not realising that it's true. And this could perhaps build pathos for him as well. A messenger then comes in panic to tell them that Aeneas's forces are approaching up the Tiber along with their Etruscan squadron, and there is instant confusion and dismay. The young men call for arms while their fathers weep, and a great clamour of dissenting voices rose to the winds like the sounds of flocks of birds settling in groves or tall trees, or swans whose harsh calls ring across the chattering pools of the river Pedusa, so rich in fish. Turnus tells the citizens not to disturb themselves and to convene the council praising peace while the enemies attack sarcastically, while he runs from the palace and calls the other men to arms. Latinus leaves the council in deep distress at the troubles of the hour and blaming himself for not eagerly welcoming Aeneas. The council members depart. Here we are told that Lavinia is with Amata, her mother, in her retinue, and she's described as the cause of all this suffering, much like Helen. She has her eyes downcast and she is called a maiden again. This could remind the readers of the Trojan War, as the war has all been for a woman. She is like another Helen of Troy. However, the fact that she is shown so passively throughout the whole epic removes blame from her. She doesn't actually have much, if any, choice in the matter of who she is to marry, and is just an innocent pawn of the gods and of fate and fortune. Furthermore, she also figures as a Roman betrayer. Then Turnus arms himself eagerly in a fury and rushes into battle willingly without even putting a helmet on. Then we are given the simile of a stallion. In this simile, he is made to seem like an uncontrollable force driven by passion and fury, just like a freed stallion would be. This is shown through the fact that he either goes to the river in a moment of split decision or to the mares where he can get sex. He is a Homeric hero, eager for bloodshed and violence and brimming with karma and furor. Turnus first meets Camilla, leaping down from her horse underneath the gates of Troy, the gates of the city, sorry, the gates of Latium. And she tells him that if the brave are right to have faith in themselves, she will go and meet the Trojan cavalry and he can stay and defend the city. He tells her that she is the glory of Italy and Virgil describes her as a formidable warrior maiden. Turner says that her spirit has no limits and says that Aeneas seems to have sent his cavalry ahead to scour the plains while he is coming into battle through the mountain country. He says that he is planning an ambush where there is a sunken path in the wood and tells her to go and meet the Etruscan cavalry and engage with them with Mesippus and Tibertus. Then Turnus goes to ambush Aeneas in a winding valley within a wood where there is a little known plateau above where someone planning an ambush would have to pass. Turnus goes there, marching by the paths he knew. Now we get onto my favourite person ever, Camilla. Diana reveals to Opis, one of her companions, that dear as Camilla is to her above all others, she has put on her armour and it will avail her nothing, i.e. she tells her that she's going to die. This perhaps emphasises that the Latins as a whole are going to be defeated, and it makes us feel more fatalistic about their future against the Trojans. Perhaps there will not be peace. Now, Camilla's father was Metabus, hated by his people for his arrogant use of power, which could be a link to the Roman kings, and he was fleeing from Provernum with her to be his companion in exile. He made for the woods, spears pressing him hard on every side, and then found his path blocked by the river Ampersenus. 
He was going to leap across, but was checked by love for his child and fear for the burden he so loved. And so he lashed her to his spear, cried out to Diana that he dedicated Camilla to her as her handmaiden. She is your suppliant. And as she flies through the air to escape her enemies, the first weapon she holds is yours. And then he throws her and then throws himself into the river, picks her up again and keeps running. No cities will take them because he's too savage to submit to them. And so he brought his daughter up in the wild, feeding her from brood mares, and once she was old enough to walk, putting a spear in her hand and a bow and arrow from her shoulder. Instead of gold in her hair and a long cloak to cover her, a tiger skin hung from her head all down her back. As she grew, many mothers wished her to marry their sons, but all she cared for was Diana, and she presented a constant love for her weapons and her chastity. Camilla has dedicated her life to Diana, basically. She says that who, um, this is Diana, Diana says that whoever violates that sacred body with a wound, be he Trojan or Italian, must pay for me an equal penalty in blood. After they have been killed, she will close, com close Camilla's body in cloud and take her to lie in a tomb in her own country. Opis, one of her handmaidens and presumably a minor goddess deified by her, is asked to carry out the mission. And Virgil uses a lovely bit of imagery to describe the fighting. He uses fire imagery to show the amount of passion and the uncontrollability that comes with war, and he uses water and sea imagery, which again shows the uncontrollability of war and the massive amount of death. The Latins keep turning backwards and forwards, taking the Trojans by surprise, although I doubt this would continue being surprising if they simply kept doing it, like a false retreat. Camilla um, is said to be exulting in the bloodshed in the middle of the battle, showing Homeric karma. She's also called the Amazon Camilla and therefore showing a typical affair of the unknown in the terrifying, independent and barbaric woman figured as the Amazon. She's like Penthesilea. If you want to read about that, I'm just going to check. I've got a book on it and I'm going to show you it because it's really good. Hmm. Can't actually see it. It's kind of sad. Okay, well, I do have one. Um, it's yellow. I can't remember the name. I'll find it and I'll tell you about it because it's really good. So we are told that Camilla can fight in many different ways and with many different weapons. Sometimes the pliant spears came thick from her hand. Sometimes, unwearied, she caught up her mighty double axe and the golden bow and arrows of Diana rang on her shoulder. Whenever she has to retreat, she fires arrows instead while still running, and her chosen companions are all around her, chosen by her for their beauty and made to do her honour by their beauty and be her own trusted attendants in peace and war. We have a very detailed and gory list of the men who she kills and how she kills them, which is extensive, and so shows her prowess in battle. For every dart that flew from her hand, a Trojan hero fell. There are many similes used to describe Camilla and her power, and there is follows. Um, her and her women are described as like the Amazons of Thrace. Um, she runs as swift as fire, and she seizes the reins and exacts punishment from her enemy in blood as easily as the sacred falcon flies from his crag to pursue a dove high in the clouds, catches it, holds it, and rips out its entrails with hook claws while blood and torn feathers float down from the sky. These similes are very effective as they serve to emphasise the violence and prowess of Camilla, making her like a Homeric hero and showing her as a real threat to the Trojan forces. Her power is not diminished just because she is a woman, and that perhaps makes her even more frightening. Jupiter intervenes at this point, rousing Tarkon to bitter battle and laying on him the sharp goad of anger. Tarkon then rides among his retreating squadrons, whipping them up with all manner of cries, and asks them what they are afraid of and why they are possessed of such rank cowardice. He tells them that Camilla is just a woman, and then makes fun of his men for being more eager to go into feasts and lovemaking than to go into battle. They are unmanly men. So Tarkon makes a wild charge at Venulus, tearing him from his horse as he flew like fire across the plain. Then he breaks off the head of Venulus' spear and looks for exposed flesh in order to kill him with it. And then we get a simile of an eagle and a snake. Uh, this simile is very important because it invokes the idea of Actium. The eagle represents Rome as a symbol of its standards, while the snake represents Egypt. As, um, and the snake is ultimately beaten and killed by the eagle. Rome always wins out. So Aaron's um, circles around Camilla, trying to find the easiest approach to her, and we are told that he follows her everywhere in the battle. She was swift of foot, but he was more than her equal with the javelin and far superior in cunning. In this way, he's a bit like a hunter, like the eagle in the above simile. 
Chloreus, a man who was consecrated to Sibylle and had been a priest, attracts Camilla's attention, resplendent in his Phrygian armour and spurring his foaming warhorse. He is wearing a lot of gold and bright colours and embroidered trousers, and Virgil says that she picks him out in battle, blind to all else and unthinking, burning with all a woman's passion for spoil and plunder. Of course, as a woman, she's subject to vain passions and moments of complete stupidity. This uh, passage is actually what came up in my Oxford interview. Just to let you know. Um, Aaron tells his spear as he prays to Apollo, um, who is Augustus's favourite god, mentioning how pious the Trojans are towards him and asking him to grant that Camilla, whom he calls this deadly scourge, will be defeated by his spear. Apollo hears and grants his prayer, but he doesn't allow him to return home afterwards, so we know that Aaron's is going to die as well. Camilla is not thinking about weapons approaching her, and so the shaft struck home beneath her naked breast and lodged there drinking deep of her virgin blood, without her being able to deflect it. Her companions rush around to help her, and Aaron's flees, afraid to face the weapons of the warrior maiden. Then we have a simile of his reaction to having killed her, which is quite cowardly. As when a wolf has killed a shepherd or a great ox and goes at once to hide high in the trackless hills before the avenging spears can come to look for him. He knows what he's done and takes fright, comforting his quivering tail by tucking it under his belly as he makes for the woods. This is rather negatively used to describe a Trojan and perhaps Virgil is wanting to show him as a coward and thus could we link it to Augustus's part in the death of Cleopatra. As there's similar awkward sympathy in Horace's ode, Cleopatra. With her dying words, Camilla tells her companion Acca, her most faithful companion, that she can do no more and to take her last commands to Turnus to tell him to come back into battle. Then she dies. Now that Camilla had fallen, the battle raged as never before. Now Opis, um, Diana's companion, uh, groans and speaks from the depths of her heart, saying that Camilla has paid too cruel a price, but that her death will not be forgotten among the peoples of this earth. And no one shall say that you have died unavenged. She says that Aaron's will pay for her death, going to the tomb of Dercanus, an ancient king. Um, and when she sees him, she tells him to come and die, saying that he must receive his reward for Camilla. Then she draws her bow and shoots him, and Aaron's comrades pay no heed, leaving him to die in some place unknown. Camilla's squadron, and then the Rutulians and the other leaders on the side, began to flee, wheeling their horses and galloping for the walls. The Latins do not stop pressing hard on them, though, and as the black cloud of the swirling dust rolled up to the walls, the mothers stood on the watchtowers, beating their breasts, and the wailing of women rose to the stars and the sky. The first Latins who burst into the gates were pressed hard by enemies and friends mixed together, and their bodies were pierced, and they breathed out their lives of death. Um, those who can't enter the city as the gates are shut are killed despite their pleading in a piteous slaughter, and we are told that those who were shut out before their own parents rolled headlong down into the ditches, while others crashed into the gates at full gallop. Even the mothers tried to protect the city. The true love of their native land showed them the way, and Camilla was their example, and they throw missiles down on top of the Trojans' heads. Turnus uh, gets this bitter news of Camilla's death while he's in the wood and it fills his heart and he brings him a great turmoil of spirit. He comes down from the woods in a frenzy and returns to the city at the same time as Aeneas. Aeneas is nearby and is headed for the city himself and they recognise each other from afar but they do not fight because the rose red sun was setting and so they make camp instead, setting up for rest in front of the city. There's only really two main questions. For this book and that the first one of these is how war is betrayed because it's all about war it's sort of positive sometimes we've got divine approval um and all of that the goddess of victory nike mars um and it's quite glorious these are the spoils i've taken from a proud king um o camilla glory of italy they were like the amazons of thrace the eagle and the snake it's quite positive here but mostly it's very very negative um it's full of despair so you've got all of the um weeping of the Trojans. You've got Virgil's interjection saying, oh, the pity of it. Um, now that Camilla had fallen, the battle raged on as never before. We've got barbarism, so it leads men to do barbaric things. We've got the human sacrifice. Um, the groans of the dying could be heard. Weapons and bodies lay deep in blood. Half-dead horses rolled about entangled with the corpses of men and ever fiercer and fiercer grew the battle. Black blood was flowing everywhere. Um, it also should be avoided. So we are scattered over the round earth, paying unspeakable penalties and suffering all matter of punishment for our crimes. That could link certainly to um, 
the Trojan War and to Diomede because that is what's said. It's just this war shouldn't be happening. And let your hands join in the treaty of peace while the chance is offered, but take care not to let your weapons clash on his. And finally, it allows for far too much pride, which we see in the characters of Aaron's and Turnus. And to the Romans, pride is bad. Also, the only other thing that we can really talk about in this book is the depiction of Turner's as a hero. He's definitely a Homeric hero. He ardently wishes to be remembered as the man who killed Aeneas, which is a desire for Kleos. He um, he has a teammate. It is his honour and pride that will not let him back down. Uh, individualistic, he fights mostly alone, but the fact that he won't have a one-on-one -on -one fight with Aeneas perhaps shows some cowardice. Through Martin Karma, he's always very eager to go into battle and prideful. He is very egotistical and takes personal offence at Chauncey's words about him. A modern hero, he's not really Homeric at all. He's causing a really awful war for no proper reason, so it's not that great. But he is doing it for the woman he loves, supposedly. And if we believe this, then perhaps he is a modern hero. A Roman hero, he shows no moderation. He's far in, he's fighting against the Trojans. Uh, so he's definitely not a Roman hero, but the Romans might admire him for his battle prowess. And a Stoic hero, he definitely does not keep his emotions in check. He's overtaken by anger at Drancy's rebuke, and he weeps at Camilla's death, etc, etc. And now we move on to the final book, which is the biggest book, and it's very good. And this is the main book that makes me think that Virgil doesn't really like us. Augustus, but you know. Okay, so we're about, yeah, we're literally halfway through. I think we can probably get this done. Okay, um, so Turnus sees the mood of his men going down and their spirits flagging at the beginning of book 12, and then realises that now he has to honour his promises and face Aeneas alone. He burns with implacable rage and his courage rises within him, and the fire metaphor shows us that his emotions have almost taken full control over him. Virgil uses the simile of a lion to describe him. Just as a lion in the fields around Carthage, he does not move into battle till he has received a great wound and then revels in it. There are many aspects of this simile that make it effective. First of all, that the animal is a lion shows a sense of ferocity and wildness in Turner's character. And secondly, the fact that the lion is in the fields around Carthage gives a link to Dido, another foreigner carried away by her passion and defeated by the Romans. Furthermore, it also adds to the idea of Aeneas as a hunter, built upon in Book 4 and Book 10. He is the merciless and skilled hunter whom the beasts are helpless against. Aeneas says to the, oh, Turnus says to the king, sorry, that Turnus keeps no man waiting. He's talking about himself in first person, he's a bit weird. And that there is no excuse for Aeneas and his men to go back on their word. He says that he's coming to meet them and that Latina should draw up a treaty. Either he will send this Trojan who has deserted Asia down into Tartarus, or Aeneas can rule over his subjects and take Lavinia as his wife. Latinus calls him a great-hearted young warrior because of this and says that the more he is courageous, the more it is his own duty to be thoughtful and balance it out. He says that he has possession of the Dornian kingdoms and all of the cities he is taking with his right hand and that he can marry other Latin or Laurentine women from the noblest families. He then tells them about the prophecy and says that it would have been wrong to unite Lavinia with anyone who had asked for her in the past, but he gave way for his love for Turnus and he took Lavinia from Aeneas and took up arms for an unjust cause. He says that twice they have been crushed by battle now and tells him to remember his own father and take pity on him as he waits in Ardea. Finally, he wishes that Turnus could stay alive and he could accept Aeneas as an ally at the same time, and he offers this. Turnus is, uh, he doesn't really... Latinus's words don't have really any effect on Turnus, and the violence of his fury mounts, and as soon as he could speak, he would forget his concern for him and let him barter his life for glory. He says you have treacherous weapons and some strength, and that Venus won't be at her tricks lurking in the treacherous shadows and trying to hide him in a cloud when he turns tail. Turnus says that Venus has her woman's tricks, and that in helping her, she's being treacherous towards the nature of battle. This is perhaps um, a revelation that he thinks Aeneas is weak and can only keep up his heroism with his mother to help him. And it could show some impiety as he is essentially rebuking a goddess. Amata is terrified by this new turn and begins to weep. She tries to check the frenzy of Turnus and begs him not to persist in keeping the Trojans in battle. Then she says that if he dies, she will kill herself too. She says that I shall never live to be a captive and see Aeneas married to Lavinia. When Lavinia hears her mother say these things, her burning cheeks were bathed in tears and the deep flush glowed and spread over her face. She's obviously very distressed by the idea of her mother dying. And Virgil uses a simile of Indian ivory being stained. 
Uh, the ivory and lilies emphasized Lavinia's civilization. As the richer a woman was, the paler her skin, because she would not she would not go outside; she'd stay inside. Also, the Indian nature perhaps emphasizes the foreign nature of their country. They are not Roman, while the flowers show delicateness. Turnus reacts distraught with love, which shows us that he really does love her, and he isn't just marrying her for material gain like Aeneas. This perhaps builds up pathos. Turnus, burning all the more for war, begs Amata not to send him to war with such an evil omen, and says that Turnus is not free to hold back the day of his death. He sends Idmon as his messenger to tell Aeneas not to lead the Trojans against the Rutulians the next day, and to instead let them fight each other. His blood or mine shall decide this war. This is the field where the hand of Lavinia shall be won. Turnus calls his horses to him, or whom Orithia, wife of Boreas, had given his grandfather Pelumnus, and they were whiter than the snow and swifter than the winds. The charioteers stand around them, and then Turnus arms himself, drawing over his shoulders the breastplate with scales of gold and pale copper, and taking up his short sword, shield, and helmet. Vulcan made the sword for his father Dornus, which emphasises his heroism. Then he snatches up his spear and speaks to it, asking it to grant him the power to bring down the effeminate Phrygian, to tear the breastplate off his body and rend it with his bare hands, to foul in the dust the hair he has curled with hot steel and steeped in myrrh. He is driven on by a blazing fury, and his eyes flash to fire. Virgil uses the simile of the bull to describe his desire for the jewel. Um, the simile could link to Pallas because Pallas was described as a bull and then swiftly turned off by killed off by Turnus himself, and it also emphasises his fury and karma for war. Aeneas is no less ferocious and is rousing himself to anger, happy about the treaties. He reassures his allies and comforts his son, telling him of the future that has been decreed, and then orders envoys to send back his answer to Latinus. Juno is looking out from the Alban Mount and sees the plain, and she immediately speaks to Juturna, Turnus' his sister and a goddess, the ruler of lakes and roaring rivers, an honour granted by Jupiter, the high king of heaven, as the price of her ravished virginity. She tells her how she's favoured her over all the other women of Italy who have sat with her husband, and how she's looked after Turnus in the walls of Latium, but now he is confronting a destiny to which he is not equal. She says how, if she dares, she should go and help her brother because it is right and proper. Juturna begins to weep and Juno tells her it is no time for tears and that she should snatch her brother from death or stir at war. You dare, I sanction. Juturna loves her brother deeply and she's been flattered into doing what she does by Juno. As well as this, Juno says she was allowed to do it and so she would not face much retribution, which first shows that Juno is good with words and she is able to convince Juturna to help her brother. And it also shows how she cares deeply for Turnus and gives her a kind of stoic attitude because she tells Juturna to put her emotions away and instead focus on saving her brother. Then we have the arrival of four special people. Latinus arrives first, looking mighty in his chariot with 12 gold rays around his temple, proof of his descent from his grandfather, the god of the sun, which is a link to Augustus and Apollo. Turnus then comes drawn by two white horses, gripping two spears in his hands, and this is not as luxurious and fancy, which perhaps shows that he has no divine lineage and it's no equal match to Aeneas. Aeneas comes from the other side of the camp, the founder of the Roman race, with his armour blazing and his shield like a star. Ascanius is next to him, the second hope for the future greatness of Rome, and a priest rides the other side of him, beginning a sacrifice. This emphasises three kinds of piety. Piety towards the state, towards the family, and towards religion. Aeneas calls the sun to witness, and Jupiter and Juno, and Mars, and various other minor deities. He asks that if victory shall come to Turnus, the defeated will go to Avanta's cities, and after this, the people of Aeneas will not rise again in war. However, if victory goes to them, he will not order Italians to obey Trojans, nor will he take royal power for himself. Rather, he will give the sacraments and the gods, and the Trojans will build the walls of a city, and Lavinia will give it her name. So that's basically Roman foreign policy. They don't impose their own way of life on other people. Like, um, they let them do what they want, like they do in Egypt. <clears throat> Latinus then swears by the same deities, but also Apollo and Artemis and Janus and the underworld. He says that the Latins will never break this treaty of the peace, and that this is his will and no power will set it aside. With these words, they seal the treaty between them. However, it seemed that this was not an even contest, and that was a massive distance in their strengths. Uh, the the Rutulians look at Turnus as he steps forward to worship like a suppliant, and his cheeks were like a boy's, and there was a pallor all over his youthful body. Jatana comes into the battle lines as Camus, whose family came from the earliest ancestors, and who was the boldest of the bold in the use of arms. And she sowed the seeds of many different rumours. 
She says that it is a disgrace to sacrifice the life of one man for all of them and that they have the same numbers. He says that, in fact, they are not actually short of enemies. Um, and he says that Turnus's fame will rise to the gods as it is. But if they lose their native land, he will be forced to obey proud masters who now sit here idling in their fields. Turner then shows the most powerful portent in the form of the tawny eagle of Jupiter flying in the red sky of morning, putting to clamorous flight the winged armies of birds along the shore, when he suddenly swooped down to the waves and seized a noble swan in his pitiless talons. The birds then shriek and wheel, forming a cloud to mob their enemy until he gave way and dropped the swan. Tolumnus is an augur and is the first to speak at this, and he says that he will lead them. He says that they are like the feeble birds, and he is attacking and plundering their short, short, short this is only us. As in this omen, they must be of one mind, um, mass their forces into one flock, and fight to defend their king, whom he has seized. Tolumnus then throws his spear, and the ranks are thrown into disorder, and in the confusion, men's hearts blazed with sudden passion. Nine brothers had, had taken their stand opposite Tolumnius, all sons of Tyrena, and it struck one of them in the stomach, and the spear drove through his ribs and stretched him out in the yellow sand. His brothers, burning with grief, draw their swords and spears and rush forward. One single passion drove them on to settle the, ma to settle the matter by the sword. Sorry, I've got hiccups. Um, everybody starts to fight, and they tear down altars, and they fell to the sky, and I'm yawning. So Latinus flees with his rejected gods, probably hoping to avoid being killed. The warriors break into chaos and begin killing and wounding each other, some leaping onto their horses to prepare for battle rather than a skirmish. Messapus, eager to wreck the treaty, rides straight to Aulestes of the Etruscans, who is a king, and strikes him with his spear fatally as he poured out prayers for mercy. He says that he is the better victim to offer the gods, and the Italy Italians run to strip the body. Corineus kicks up a torch, and as Abethus come to get him, he sets fire to his face and forces him to kneel, sinking his sword into his side. Podolarius, following the shepherd Alsus, is poisoned over, poised over to him by his, by his sword, um, but Alsus catches him first, struck him full in the middle of the forehead and split it to the chin, bathing all his armour in a shower of blood. Of course, Podolarius dies. Can't say that name. Aeneas is true to his vow and is unhelmeted, stretching out his white right hand without any weapons and asking why they're suddenly fighting. He tells them to control their armour. He says that they should leave him to fight and that they have a treaty. The rituals we have performed have made Turnus mind. The fact um, mine. The fact that Aeneas remains calm shows good leadership as he certainly isn't panicking over the fact that his men haven't kept the peace. We can also see that he is peaceful and he seems a reasonable leader but rather ineffective. If lots of men are killing each other and are driven out by bloodlust, then they're hardly going to listen to you and they tell you, you tell them to stop. While he's still speaking, an arrow strikes him, unknown the hand that shot it and the force that spun it to its target, unknown what chance or what god brought such honour to the Rutulians. When Turnus sees Aeneas leaving because of this wound, a sudden fire of hope kindles in his heart and he demands horses and arms, leaping onto his chariot and gathering up the reins with spirit soaring. He kills many heroes, crushing whole, cor whole columns of men under his chariot wheels. This would perhaps show how, when he sees Aeneas weakened, he becomes more resolved to fight. His Homeric Thumos and karma, blood and battle lust comes back. Perhaps it could suggest some cowardice, though, as he only rallies to really fight Aeneas again when he sees him wounded and thus at a disadvantage. Virgil then compares Turnus to Mars in a simile. Um, just as Mars spattered with blood charges along the banks of the icy river Hebrus, clashing sword on shield and giving full rein to his furious horses as he starts at war, um, just so did bold Turnus lash his horses through the thick of battle till they smoked with sweat. This makes him very heroic and powerful as he's compared to a god. Um, and then Turnus has Aristea. He kills Slythenelus, Imbrasiado, Glaucus, and Lades, uh, Thamyris and Pholus, Eumedes, um, Aspites, Chloreus, Sibaris, Dares, Thessilocus, and Thymoetes, uh, Phageus, um, and we have a simile um, describing him as when the breath of Thracian Boreas sounds upon the deep Aegean as he pursues the waves to the shore. So he's very, very powerful. He's like a force of nature. So Aeneas um, is bleeding and using his spear as a kind of crutch, and he is in a fury, tugging at the arrowhead and demanding that they get it out quickly so that he can go back to battle. Yapix, whom Apollo loves and has given all his arts and all his powers, prophesied the lyre and swift arrow, but Yapix chose rather to know him because his father was dying. Aeneas is growling savagery, and Ascanius is grieving as he goes up to them, and tries anxiously and in vain all he could do. 
Apollo doesn't give him any help and he cannot help him. This could be significant as Apollo was Augustus's patron and Augustus is meant to be Aeneas's ancestor. Uh, perhaps Virgil is suggesting that this is all rubbish or that Augustus isn't really related or anything to do with Aeneas or Apollo. As said before, um, Aeneas is growling savagery and Ascanius is grieving and Venus, dismayed by her son's um, undeserved suffering, picks some dittany from Mount Ida and brings it down to tincture the river water they were using with it. Yapix bathes it with that and all of the pain leaves Aeneas's body and the blood stops flowing. The arrow comes away and Aeneas is renewed, the water restoring him to his former state. Yapix rejoices and says that some greater power, some god is driving him and sending him back to greater deeds. Then Aeneas takes Ascanius in an armed embrace and kisses him over his helmet, saying that he can learn courage and hard toil from him and others will teach him about fortune. He will defend him in this war and asks him not to forget when he is a man to go over his kinsmen's examples and let his spirit rise at the thought of his father Aeneas and his uncle Hector. Aeneas returns to the battlefield in all his massive might and his escort go with him, streaming from the camp. As a dust darkens the plain and the earth trembles under their feet, the Arsonians see them and cold tremors of fear run through the marrow of their bones. Jeterna flees, but Aeneas goes on, swiftly leading his army across the plain. Um, Virgil uses a simile of when a cloud blots out the sun and begins to move from mid-ocean towards the land, um, and it destroys crops. The noun cloud suggests that the Trojans have some form of natural power, while the fact that it suggests the storm could mean they have the support of Jupiter, as he causes most storms alongside Neptune. Furthermore, the simile would be suitable for a Roman audience, as the ideal Roman was a farmer, and most Roman high-status families would own family farms. While the description of the army fits Roman tortoise shell battle techniques, and so would emphasise that these people are Roman and that they're going to win. The Rutulians turn and flee, raising the dust on their backs because they're terrified by the sight of them. And Aeneas thinks that it isn't fit to cut down men who have turned away from him, and he also doesn't go after the men who have stayed to meet him in combat. Instead, he's looking for Turnus and only Turnus, and this shows how he wants to stick to the treaty. Juturna is stricken with fear, and she throws out Turnus' driver, Matiscus, taking the reins herself in the image of him, like a black swallow flying through the great house of some wealthy man and collecting tiny scraps of food and dainties for her young chattering on the nest. She gives glimpses of her brother in triumph, but she will not allow him to join the battle. Aeneas is very determined to meet Turnus, however, and he follows him, trying every time to catch Turnus and being foiled by Juturna. We're told that conflicting tides seethed in his mind, but no answer came, and different passions drove him to opposing thoughts. When, however, he barely dodges a spear from Messapus and he sees Turnus withdraw, he plunges himself into his enemies, terrible in his might, with a Mars aiding him and roused to savage slaughter. This shows that he is fixed to the last to stick to the treaty, but eventually his furor is roused and he is subject to emotions. Virgil asks what God could unfold all this bit of suffering and asks if it was Jupiter's will that peoples who were to live at peace for all time should clash so violently in war. This shows that Virgil really doesn't like war and that he would rather avoid it. Aeneas and Turnus then kill in succession. Um, Aeneas kills Sucro and Turnus meets Diores and Amicus. Um, Aeneas kills Talos, Tanias, Cethegus and Onites, and then Turnus kills the Lycian brothers and Menoetes. Um, for Aeneas, it emphasizes his battle prowess and the extent of Fiora and giving him this Aristea like this. And in the sense of Turnus, it shows some barbarism as he beheads his victims and he uses their heads as trophies, just as the Egyptians did um, with Pompey. Uh, however, the fact that they kill so close to each other and the same number emphasises they are equal in strength and worthy opponents. Menoetes, we are told, hated war, but this didn't save him. He came from Arcadia like Pallas and he was poor while his father sowed his crops in hard land. It shows how um, futile war is because it always ends in violent death. He dies. Um, Virgil describes Aeneas and Turnus in natural terms, like fires started in different places in a dry wood or in thickets of crackling laurel, or like foaming rivers roaring as they run down in spate from the high mountains to the sea. The noun fires and rivers show uncontrollable passion and furor as it, as it connotes them um, and links them to natural forces and that much power. Venus then gives Aeneas the idea to go to the city and besiege it and throw the Latins into confusion at such a calamity. He notices the city and touched by this great war and his spirit is fired. He calls the leaders together and the whole legion joins them and he stands on the mound of earth to address them. He tells them that there cannot be a delay in carrying out his commands and that Jupiter is on their side. The city is the cause of the war and Latinus's kingdom, um, if he does not obey, will be rooted out by Aeneas 
and he will level its smoking roofs to the ground. He says that he will not wait for Turnus any longer and that the city is the head and heart of the wicked war. We shall claim our treaty with fire. The Trojan forces then form a wedge with equal resolve in their hearts and they rush to the gates and cut the first guards to pieces. Aeneas stands among them, uh, calling the gods to witness that this was the second time he had been forced into battle. And discord rises among the citizens and some want the city to be opened up to receive the Trojans and they drag the king onto ramparts. Others rush to defend the city. And Virgil likens the attack to the simile of the shepherd and bees uh, when a shepherd tracks bees to their homes and smokes them out. The bees were associated with the defeated as it is thought that in a battle against other forces, bees crowded around the enemy's standards and they were defeated. When Amata sees the enemy approaching the city and there is no Turnus to ha help them, she thinks that he has been killed and her mind becomes deranged with grief and she screams that she is the cause, the guilty one, the fountainhead of all of these evils. She resolves to die and she dies a hideous death in the noose of a rope tied to a high beam. When the women hear of this, Lavinia is the first to tear her golden hair and rosy cheeks and the whole household is wide with grief, wild with grief, while Latinus goes about with his garments torn, dazed by the death of his wife. Turnus is in wild dismay when he realises that Aeneas is attacking the city and he asks why there is so much grief and distress in the walls and so much clamour coming from the city. Jaterna wishes for him to go after some Trojans with her, saying that there are others whose hands can defend the city and she says that he will kill as many as Aeneas does and will not fall short in glory. But Turnus says that he recognised her a while ago and he asks why she has come to witness the cruel death of her brother. He talks about her comrades who have died and says that he has to fight for the city. He is prepared to face the gods of the underworld and he says that his spirit will come down to them unstained, knowing nothing of such dishonour and worthy of my great ancestors to the end. This shows that he is very courageous and a Homeric hero as he does not fear death. Sakes has an arrow wound to his face and he says that the Turnus is the city's last hope of safety and that he must take pity on his people. Aeneas's sword and spear, spear are described as like lightning, which perhaps shows Jupiter's favour and he tells him that the queen has killed herself. Fear overcame her and she fled the light of day. He begs him to come back and help them. Turnus is thunderstruck and stands there dumb and staring. We are told it in his heart see the bitter shame, a grief shot through with madness, love driven on by fury and a consciousness of his own courage. He looks at the city which is burning and feels that he is shirking his duty to protect it. Turnus then tells his sister that the fates are too strong and they have to go where cruel God and cruel fortune call, and so into battle. He says that this is madness, but asks that before he dies, she should let him be mad. And then he leaves his sister to grief behind him as he rushes into battle. Virgil then uses the simile of a boulder to describe Turnus as he rushes into battle, which shows how he's doomed to fall and die, but he still has the force of nature. Turnus then tells the two armies to put up their weapons and says that it is better for him to be the one man who atones for this treaty for all of them and settles the matter with the sword. Uh, what he says, the armies part and leave a clear space between them. Aeneas uh, reacts uh, well to the news. He abandons the city and breaks up all his works of war and leaps for joy and clasps, clasps his armour um, with a noise as terrible as thunder. And Virgil emphasises his strength by saying he is as huge as Mount Athos or Eryx or Father Apennines himself. to be amazed along the other men at the sight of uh, Turnus and Aeneas, these two huge heroes born at opposite sides of the earth coming together to decide the issue by the sword. They throw their spears at long range and the earth groans when they meet each other. As they fight, chance and courage met and mingled in confusion and then they are described with the simile of a bull. Just as two enemy, enemy bulls in the great mountain of Scylla are on top to burn and bring their horns to bear and charge into battle. The fact that they are both bulls emphasises the fact that they are equally matched Unlike Pallas and Turnus in Book 10, it also shows the ferocity with which they fight. Jupiter has a pair of scales and he puts the lives of both men in them to decide who would be condemned in the ordeal of battle and with whose weight death would descend. This perhaps suggests that Aeneas's standing rim isn't fated, uh, which would be pessimist a uh, debate. Uh, Turnus' sword breaks mid-blow and leaves him defenceless and then he begins to flee faster than the east wind. The same simile is used for Cacus in Book 8. Book eight. I put book 13 into book 8. And so perhaps this hints that Aeneas will defeat him just as Hercules defeated Cacus. We begin to see that he is not well matched with Aeneas because when his sword met his divine armour, the mortal blade was brittle as an icicle and shattered on impact. He is no match for a divine man. Aeneas doesn't let up in his pursuit, and though he is slow in his pursuit because of the arrow wound, he, he is still ablaze with fury and keeps hard on his heels. He uses the simile of a hunt again, which shows... Um, how long the pursuit is taking. 
Turnus keeps shouting at the Rutulians and asking for his sword, but Aeneas is threatening death and destruction for anyone who comes near, and he doesn't slacken the pursuit. We hear that five times round they ran in one direction, five times they rewound the circle. Turnus is panicked, and as Aeneas tries to pull his spear out of a tree, he is wild with fear and begs Faunus and Sibylle to hold on to the spear. Aeneas remains delayed. Jaterna then helps Turnus by changing into Pediscus' shape again and running forward to give him his sword. Venus is indignant that she was allowed to be so bold, and so she wrenches the spear out for Aeneas, and then we are told that these glorious warriors, their weapons and their spirits restored to them, stood there breathing hard, ready to engage in the contest of war. Jupiter then sees uh, Juno watching the battle and asks her a lot of questions. Uh, so he asks her, what will be the end of this? What is there left for you to do? Why are you scheming? Why do you hope to achieve, um, what do you hope to achieve, sorry, by perching there in those chilly clouds? Was it right that a god should suffer violence and be wounded by the hand of a mortal? Was it right that Turner should be given back the sword that was taken from him? For what could Turner have done without your help? And why have you put strength in the arm of the defeated? He reminds her that Aeneas is a god of this land, has a right to heaven and is fated to be raised to the stars. He also tells her that the end has come and he forbids her to go on fighting against the Trojans. The time has come at last for you to cease and give way to our entreaties. Juno's head is bowed and she says that she has abandoned the earth and turned us against her own wishes because of Jupiter's insistence. She says that she persuaded to turn us to help Turnus, but she didn't help her any more than that and she swears this by the sticks. She says that she will now yield and quit these battles, but she entreats Jupiter not to make the lessons change their name. They are men. Do not make them change their voice or native dress. Let there be Latium. Jupiter smiles and grants her what she wishes, that the people of Alsonia will keep their language and their customs, and the Trojans will join them in body only. Ritual I will give and the modes of worship, and I will make them all Latin, speaking one tongue. He then does some healthy praising of the Roman race and some totally subtle propaganda. Um, saying that they will be above all men, above the gods in devotion, and no other race will be their equal in paying your honour. And this fits in with the Capitoline triad and finally resolves that awkward problem. Jupiter then prepares to dismiss her, uh, dismiss, dismiss Jaterna from Turnus' side and sends one of the monsters named Dirai, who attend the throne of savage Jupiter in his royal palace, uh, and he sends him down to confront her as an omen. She's given the symbol of an arrow, showing how quick she is. And uh, it's quite significant because Aeneas has just been attacked by an arrow, and so this will wound Jaterna and therefore Turner significantly. Also, because it is a weapon, it gives a sense that Turnus is going to be defeated. Um, Jaterna recognises the Dira from a long way off and grieves, tearing her hair and scratching her face. She says that she cannot do anything else to help her brother now, and she knows the beating of your wings and the sound of death. Finally, she says that she understands Jupiter's commands and asks why he will not put an end to her sufferings and why she must watch her brother die in pain. Departing, she covers her head in a veil and moans bitterly before plunging into the depths of her own river. Aeneas keeps pressing on behind uh, Turnus and he asks him why Turnus is still delaying and running away, saying that this isn't a race but a fight with dangerous weapons at close quarters. He says that he can do whatever he wants, turn yourself into any shape you like, um, etc etc Turnus replies saying that Aeneas is fierce but the wild words do not frighten him and it is the gods that he fears he seems to acknowledge that Jupiter is against him saying that he only fears the enmity of Jupiter then Turnus picks up an ancient boundary stone huge which 12 picked men like those in the earth now produces could scarcely lift so it shows that it's heroic age but he hurls it at his enemy easily although trembling however he has no sense of running or letting and his knees give way his blood chilled and frozen and the rock rolled in front of them then we have a simile um so it's like when we when we fall asleep and we're exhausted that's why Turnus can throw it this perhaps shows his weakness and maybe it's absolute physical exhaustion we're told that as this happened he faltered with fear and began to tremble and he couldn't see any way out of his chariot or sister he starts to lose hope Aeneas's spear is then called deadly and he is shown purely as a force to throw his spear his eyes picking the spot where it needs to go we're told that st stones hurled by siege artillery the siege artillery never hit war like this and the crash of the bursting thunderbolt is not so loud this all emphasizes his power and we get a simile which further emphasizes this uh, like a dark whirlwind it flew carrying death and destruction with it the spear goes through the middle of Turnus's thigh and he falls down bending his knees to the ground and the Rutulians groan Turnus then stretches out his right hand to beg as a suppliant and says that he has brought all this on himself and asked for nothing. He says that Aeneas should make use of what fortune has given him, so Lavinia and Latium, but that he wishes that Aeneas would take pity on his father and give him back to his people, dead or alive. He then finally admits a full defeat. 
and asks him not to carry his hatred any further. Aeneas at first rolls his eyes and then checks his hands and hesitates as Turnus's words begin to move him. He considers mercy, which would be the Roman route to ro roll down, but um, then his eyes catch the baldric of the boy palace on Turnus's shoulder and he sees that he's taking his armour as a spoil. He feasts his eyes on the sight as a reminder of his own wild grief and he is burning with mad passion and terrible in his wrath. He then asks Turnus whether he is to escape him now when he is wearing the spoils stripped from the body of those he loved, and says that by the wound that he will kill him with, it is Pallas who exacts the penalty in your guilty blood. He's blazing with rage and he plunges the steel into Turnus's chest, and the last words of the Iliad are, the limbs of Turnus were dissolved and cold, and his life left him with a groan, fleeing in anger down to the shades. Aeneas is not heroic here at all. I mean, he's, he's homerically heroic. But he's not her Eric. Um, this is the main reason that people think the Aeneid is not positive about Augustus. So very quick fire. The ending's brilliant, but it's not great. You know, it basically it doesn't praise Augustus at all. Um, there's a lot of piety towards the state. Aeneas goes on and finds Rome to the gods. Aeneas intends to place with the gods multiple, multiple times throughout the book. Uh, to family, Aeneas says goodbye to Ascanius and tells him that he will teach him of hard work. And Turnus begs Aeneas to spare him for the sake of his father. We have father some relationships with Turnus and Dornus, um, Aeneas and Ascanius, Aeneas and Anchises. Um, brother and sister, Turnus and Chiturna. Turnus is very thankful for her helping and Chiturna tries to fiercely protect her um, and she has to be physically scared away from by Jupiter to stop her. Mother and daughter are Marta and Lavinia. Um, and Lavinia is the first to grieve for her mother, showing her love for her. Husband and wife, Jupiter and Juno, they're finally in agreement, so it's harmony. Latinus and Amata, he's in a daze after he hears of the wife's, his wife's death. Mother and son, Venus and Aeneas. Venus continually helps Aeneas throughout the book. War, war is very negative in general. It's, there's nothing positive about war. You could literally say anything that happens in the book and it would not be positive about war. Heroism, um, Homeric, you get Fiora from Aeneas, Karma from Aeneas and Turnus, Thumos from Aeneas and Turnus, Godly Help from Aeneas and Turnus, and the one-on-one -on -one fight is like the one between Aeneas and Paris, except much more hands-on. Uh, they aren't Roman at all, to be honest, not modern at all, and not stoic at all. And that's basically it. Yes, yeah, so at the end of the Aeneid, as I've gone over it, with you. Um, yeah, uh, I hope you. I hope you found that useful. Um, whenever we next go on it. We'll go through it, but yeah. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. It's a bit embarrassing. Okay, um, all right. Thank you for watching. Um, next we'll be going over themes uh, as they appear on the spec. So uh, thank you, and see you soon. Bye bye. Oh, haven't even pressed end yet. Bye. <laughs>